This is a 2017 1.5 Mazda MX-5 ND. We are the One Lapiros, we are at the Nürburgring. What's so special about all of this? Well, what's so special about this very car is that it has been the one and only car I've been driving for the last three years. Over 80,000 kilometers traveling across Europe, going for bike trips, ski trips. I've moved apartment with it. So we feel it's about time for us to share with you what's really like to live for such a long time with an MX-5 as your only car. This, of course, as long as the weather allows us, it's deep into March. Probably in your house it's 20 degrees, but here it's snowing. I'm freezing. I don't want to stand in front of this camera anymore. I just want to go into the car and crank the heater on and start talking about what it's really like. This is a 992 GT3. Sounds cool, eh? All right, let's start this beast and get cracking. If I can find my belt. Uh, okay, so three years ago, I needed a new car and uh, I had uh, quite, a, quite a few specific requirements. Uh, some of them completely personal and some of them uh, actual you know something that I actually needed so the car had to be a rear-wheel drive and this is completely personal and the car had to be relatively interesting the car had to be manual um, but also the car had to be affordable to buy affordable to insure affordable to run and uh, interesting so you can imagine uh, that it's quite a difficult combination to, to make work because how can you have something that is cool, that is interesting, that is rear-wheel drive, that is manual, that is cheap? Uh, well, actually you can. Uh, it's an MX-5. This, of course, would, would not sound completely reasonable uh, if you consider the case use, which mostly is long-distance trips across Europe 600, 700 kilometers at a time, every other week, uh, going on racetracks mostly. So you wouldn't immediately think of a petrol engine 1.5 two-seater convertible because you know there is no space. It, it's not the car that you want. You know that as any sane person would have gone for whatever I have, whatever whatever car would work best for that case use, which is. A diesel car, automatic, uh, comfortable, not a single worry, uh, which is exactly what I've been driving just before I bought this because at that time I was driving a diesel company car, which did the job perfect, but always left me uh, a little bit cold. Like, it, it, you know, I like driving, uh, so I, I am a race driver, but beside this, I really like cars and I like driving, so for me it's just just not going from a to b uh, i wanted to f i want to feel something when i do when i'm doing it um, so basically at that time the only reasonable option uh, was an nd uh, because one of the key features that i also needed was the car for the car reliability so the car must must be reliable because the last thing i want is to maybe start a trip late into the evening through the night and then break down somewhere so buying an old NA or keep on using the ring banana or whatever it might have been uh, it is not really feasible would not have been really feasible because the danger of it breaking down although the car is reliable uh, is too big and in case something went wrong I also needed uh, the car to be relatively new so that the, for it to have uh, uh, to be still under warranty uh, and all this sort of stuff so the ND sort of uh, sort of fit perfectly, I thought at the time, fit perfectly, ticks most of the boxes. And of course, there are compromises. Uh, and uh, deep inside, maybe at one stage or another, I thought of going even crazier. So going for something that is even more interesting to drive, even more unique, even more of an occasion, uh, sort of a race car for the road. but. While I would have enjoyed that side, it would not have been realistic. So I had it. So I had the Lotus S1, which is as close as you can get to an actual race car for the road. 
Um, and uh, I, I know for a fact that I ended up not driving it uh, as much as I wanted it because it's, it's not really viable, it's not really usable. It's too much of a compromise, at least for me, I'm not hardcore enough, but I know many people that uh, say that are hardcore, but really when they are, when they are there and uh, having a, a race car for the road, they end also ended up, ended up not driving it. So what you think you want might not be what you will be able to actually do. Uh, and I had this experience before, so I managed not to fall into this trap again. Talking about what in real life, what it turned out to be and how much it did end up costing. The car was, uh, when I bought it, was roughly 25,000 Swiss francs, which was a very good price. I think the car now is over 30 if you want to buy it new. And uh, what about actually running the car for, uh, for all this time? So 82,000 kilometers in three years. Um, Average fuel consumption is around 6.5 liter for 100 uh, kilometers, so extremely, and I, I, I didn't drive it slow, uh, I didn't drive it flat out either, but normal driving, 6.5 liters per 100 kilometers, it's almost diesel car consumption, which is exactly what I needed. As far as the um, intervals and maintenance, beside the mandatory mandatory services, which I did uh, yearly, or whenever the kilometers uh, interval came, which were about 300, uh, 300 Swiss francs, depending. But of course, this is uh, highly influenced uh, on the country. So the hourly rate of a mechanic in Switzerland is much higher than it, than it is in Italy. So in Italy, I think these numbers would sound completely bonkers and crazy, but so I think in Italy, I don't really know, but I think in Italy you could take 100 Swiss francs off that price easily. So besides spending, yeah, let's say 200, between 200 and 300 Swiss francs per year to do the service, I did nothing to the car. The car has still its original set of tires. It still has its original set of discs. It still has the original set of pads. I did nothing to the car. Not because, not because I'm skipping it or because I want to run it cheaply, but simply because it didn't need it. Because the car is less than a thousand kilo and uh, it is not so powerful, so you're not go very, very fast anywhere. And uh, you don't need to brake so much. So basically, you ended up not using the brake. So for, as, far as, as far as this side of the equation, such as the reliability, ease of maintenance, costs. The car hit the mark perfectly. I think I could have not have bought a better car in this regard. Like literally, I don't think there are so many cars that can do this full stop, no matter how much money you're gonna spend on them. Um, uh, if you buy a modern Golf or if you buy a modern BMW diesel car, yes, it might be. Um, a little bit better on fuel economy, but you s I don't see anybody running 90,000 kilometers or 85,000 kilometers on a set of discs and a set of pads, and you're gonna have problems because everybody knows that, especially when you buy a relatively new model, you go through few, you know, few niggles that the car develops through the time, electronical issues, whatever it might be. This car, bomb-proof, literally bulletproof. Absolutely fantastic uh, ownership experience uh, on this regard, and I couldn't be happier. Of course, what kind of YouTube car review would this be without um, a top five things that I hate and top five things that I love? about my MX-5 and the after three years of ownership. Well, let's start from the hate. From the least hateful feature, I would imagine that this must be the, the charging ports. The charging ports are just useless. If you plug your phone into one of the two USB charging ports, 
then it will discharge if you are using it for a GPS or Spotify or music and I cannot imagine how Mazda could have missed this. This is just such a small thing, yet it makes such an impact in an everyday usability of the car. Of course, there is a 12 volts plug that you could use instead, but it's hidden in almost an unreachable place. And uh, you have to have a two meters long cable to be able to use it. I, I really don't get it. It's not such a big problem, but it gets to your nerves. You know, if you use it every day, it is something that will, will be disappointing. On the same sort of level, I would say I would put the windows control. So basically they have automatic descent, automatic opening. So you click it once, they come down and you don't need to stay there. But if you want to close them, you have to hold them. So when you stop, for example, on the highway and you have to pay with your card and the window goes down and then you drive off and it's such a frustrating thing to have to stay there with your finger. I know it's such a small thing actually, but if you use it and repeat it over time, it's just unbearable. After this I would put probably uh, the noise. Of course, you know, I am aware of the fact that I've bought a Roadster that is not going to be as, uh, as quiet as a closed cockpit car, but the noise is just unreal. You can't have a phone call in this car, it's just impossible. The roof sort of jiggles and wiggles about and there's always some kind of noise you might even pick it up in this video and it's not just road noise it's the wind noise for the, it's everything it's not engine noise though unfortunately so the car is uh, very very loud and this is something that uh, i certainly underestimated when i decided to buy the car i especially underestimated how much of an impact it would be the next thing I have to say, uh, the general ergonomics. This is the first generation ND, which had the adjustable steering wheel in height, but not in reach, such as I cannot put it further away from me or pull it towards me. This combined with a fixed sitting position in height, so I cannot put the seat lower or higher, it's just fixed. I can move it forward and backwards and I can recline it, but even reclining it is limited by the nature of the thing, that's the fact that there is no space behind me. So all these limitations combined make for a very, very weird sitting position. So either I find the right position for my arms, so I, and, but then I am so close to the pedals that my legs hit the bottom of the steering wheel, or I find the right position for my feet and my legs and then I'm so far away from the steering wheel that I cannot reach cannot, I cannot reach it comfortably and uh, the only way I could find to find a sort of a solution to this was to move the seat forward as more forward than I would normally do and then recline it a lot more than I would normally do which makes for a slightly uncomfortable sitting position at least to my tastes but it's the only way I can sort of fix all the issues because this I means that I can fit. So with my head, it means that I have a relatively okay reach to the steering wheel and uh, it means that uh, I can still use the pedals uh, properly. But, uh, and I'm a normal build, like uh, I'm, uh, I'm one meter 80 tall. So it's, I'm generally normal build, but the car is just uh, so weird in that sense. Um, the thing that I hate absolutely the most about this car, and I, I know that this can be controversial, and there will be, we will discuss this in the video a little bit more in depth, but the thing that I hate the most is the steering feel. And I know this can sound uh, outrageous, because this is, this should be what this car is about, but the steering feel is horrid. Honestly, I have no words to describe it beside horrible and horrid. When you're traveling in a straight line, or actually at any stage when you're driving, if you release your hands from the steering wheel, the steering wheel doesn't come back to center. It just stays sort of to the angle that you're steered into. There is no self-centering torque or very, very little of it, which makes it for an extremely weird sensation when you're driving. It is like reversed force feedback, so to speak. Such as, such as that when you turn the wheel, you don't get a sensation of the torque increasing by the time you're steering. It just stays linear. And then when you release your hands, it just stays 
turned. It's like there is not enough self-centering force. And this, look at this, it's ridiculous. So this means that outside of the corner, so this means that if I'm doing now a corner on the right, it means that I have to physically straighten the wheel at the exit of the corner and there is no feeling. It's just, it feels empty when you do it, but you must do it because otherwise the thing will stay stunned. It's absolutely incredible the way this car feels. I have never driven anything that feels like this. And this also makes it for an extremely busy ride when you're driving on a highway. And I'm not talking 200, I'm talking 130, 140. It's a co you are continuously adjusting the steering wheel because the car, the steering wheel is never centered. The car never wants to go straight. The car always wants to go either to the right or to the left. Anyway, we talk more in depth about the handling later. Then again, there is plenty of stuff that I really like about this car and this is the top five things that I love. Number one is the looks. I think it was a bit controversial at the beginning, especially the rear, uh, but uh, it's aging really well. Unlike the NC, which uh, was always controversial and I still don't like by this time, uh, I really like the NDs, uh, although it is in, in stock form, so quite high up, but I still think it's cool. Another thing that I absolutely love is the, the way the gearbox feels. It's really snatchy, it's really cool, it's really easy to um, heel and toe, especially when not driving on track. I'm not talking about the, the ratio or the spacing, but just the way that it feels when you're shifting gears. It's actually pleasurable to go from second, third, fourth, this kind of stuff. It's really cool. And together with this, I think that the next thing that I really love about the car is the the way the engine and the way the, the power level uh, combines with everything. Uh, it's a Revy engine and it doesn't have so much torque so you have to shift quite a few times but it doesn't feel underpowered as an NA felt. It feels like it has, a, it has enough power to, to have fun while, without ending up in trouble and uh, especially uh, the second, third, fourth gear sections, the car really, really, really shines there and I, I, it's, it's fun, you know, to go through the gears. It's actually um, a lot of fun. The next thing that I really love about this car, which is uh, coming to uh, in its own for uh, everyday use, is the infotainment. It's nothing super fancy, it doesn't even have uh, Apple CarPlay for that matter, but it's just, it just works, you know? You put the destination in, it's easy to put the destination in, it's easy to, to find the points of interest. Uh, if you have to go to an airport, it's easy to pick the airport. Even the zoom feature works for me. Uh, it's perfect and every day this takes a lot of stress out of the experience and uh, makes it pleasurable uh, to use and uh, it has been very useful for me. Naturally now it's time to talk about the one thing, the one feature that I love the most about this car. And it's the roof. Although I'm not a big fan of open top cars and uh, admittedly I drive this car 99% of the time closed but I just appreciate the sheer ingenuity and engineering marvel that this roof is. It's unbelievable. One hand moving, what, five seconds? It's incredible. Incredible. That is the best feature of the car. That might be one of the best features in any car because I have never seen, I have never seen such a well-engineered roof. I've never had this experience before. It's amazing, incredible. And it's not like to only open it. And it's closed. It's unreal. You've heard now five things that I love, five things that I hate, and you might be thinking, yeah, well, but I knew most of them already. That doesn't sound so interesting. Is this really all? that the one lap heroes have to give about this? And of course, the answer is no. As you know, we are very opinionated and we don't shy away from a controversy. So let's go and have it. The ND is actually quite a bad car. What the ND is, is 
all the negative sides of a sports car roadster condensed with all the negative sides of a regular run-of-the-mill uh, diesel uh, car. And let me explain it a little bit before you start screaming and writing in the comments that I don't understand anything. Mazda built this car with a mission which was not to build a performance car but was to have like a MX-5 NA reborn to go back to the roots to step away from the NC to strip away ultimate performance but have a light car that is fun to drive at low speeds this is what they wanted to do and this is what they achieved but the way they went after it I don't think works because they made the car and this is something that you are familiar with if you know the car they made the car extremely soft and they made the car behave like a car that is 50 years old so it's not a matter of giving it low grip so that the car would slide at low speed they just built a car that actually feels like an NA it actually does but the NA is 31 years old I don't want to buy a new car that feels 31 years old do you? nobody fucking does nobody wants that I don't feel that anybody wants that and this is what they did so the car doesn't have low grip the car has modern tires the car actually grips in the corners but it's, it's set up to feel like it doesn't grip the steering wheel is completely empty it doesn't self-center it feels like a, it, honestly it feels like a steering wheel from 50 years old car and the way the body roll is so much roll in the rear it feels like the rear is stepping out all the time but it isn't you know, the car is actually quite quite grippy to some extent because the tires are modern so you have the grip but you have the feeling of not having it so you could say yeah but at least it's comfortable on the bumps but, but I'm not buying an MX-5 for that because the, the car is extremely comfortable on the bumps you barely feel anything but if I want that I buy something else I'm not gonna buy an MX-5 for that so I really think that while Mazda had a solid idea which was to build a car that was not focused on the ultimate performance envelope the way they went after it is I think to me is just wrong just wrong because the car it's not like if it if it if it had low grip that I could slide it everywhere you know and enjoy it at 50 I would I would say to you yes the car has low grip it slides slip and slides it's okay it's fine but the car doesn't do that it just rolls it rolls like a 2CV so you actually have quite a lot of grip because the car rolls so much so but this is not it just feels bad it just feels horrible it just feels frustrating because you have a car that looks like this so it looks good it looks sporty and of course I don't want a GT3 RS but I want a car that is good in the corners that's the whole point that is the whole point of this car is to be good in the corners and it's horrible in the corners completely unacceptable and I feel that I actually felt when I bought it that I was making an informed decision I am an experienced I am an experienced race driver I I had other sports car so I felt I was buying something that I wanted but in reality I didn't this is because the normal reviews you see they say how oh, the car feels amazing and alive it's all it's all crap how this doesn't this feels anything but alive it just feels bad if you it's like classic cars talk to somebody that owns a classic car they say I bought I bought it for what it represents for what it means or because I like it but it drives horrible that is the summary of the MX-5 ND it drives like a classic car and if you want that be my guest go and buy it but I don't want it by the way through the power of editing you might be able to see this 
Nice. I think this is a car that has feeling. I think that car has feeling. I think the car is a GT3 RS prototype. Uh, cool. I uh, will never be able to afford it. All this negativity though doesn't mean that this car is just wrong on absolute terms. This car is wrong for me. So I'm not the customer for this car. But of course I believe that there are customers. So who is this car for? Well, I would imagine I would imagine my father maybe enjoying it. You know? He goes out with my mum for a weekend on the lake, roof down, he drives 50, between 50 and 80 the whole day. He drives all the corners slow. He's just enjoying the sun and enjoying his day. If you're looking for that, I don't think you can buy anything better. But for anybody else, from the performance-driven guy to the drifting, whatever, driven guy, to the genuine car enthusiast, just know that you're buying something that at the very least needs a lot of work to make it what you want. Would the two liters be better? Yes. But the gap between what this is and what I would consider good is so big that I don't believe that the difference between this and the, and, and the two liter would fix that. The two liter has a little bit more torque. But the last thing this car needs if anything, is torque or engine power. Because the car is okay in the straights. It's not fast, but it's not slow. So, you might be the right customer for this car. I know I am not. And uh, I know Costas is not. And I know Sergio is not. I actually don't know many that are the right customers, but this is because you know we tend to hang out with people we have something in common with. But I can see this car being a very good car for some of you. Just be aware of what you're buying. All right. We had two outside shots planned for the whole thing and these are the only two moments it's snowing. I don't know how this can happen, but it's happening. The Nürburgring weather always delivering. The question that I ask myself might be also the question that, that you are asking or you are wondering about. So would I, would I buy this car again if I had the, the, the way to go back in time? No. So I would not buy this car again, not knowing what I know now. I don't have an answer as to what I would buy instead, but knowing how much, how much of a sort of a disappointment this has been, I couldn't force myself to live through it again. So, uh, so no, I wouldn't buy it uh, again. Nevertheless, we are the Wallap heroes. So we will progressively ruin the car in the coming weeks in the pursue of making it better so I know it's a bit crazy yeah so we will we will destroy it so that it's cool afterwards the chances of success are very small but this has never stopped us as this car can can prove I highly suggest you to follow us and see how this evolves the grand scheme of things is at the end I will uh, keep it because at this stage I just want to get rid of it and sell it as quickly as possible but maybe this will change uh, so maybe after giving it the one lap year of treatment i will keep it maybe 10 years and that will be a great success this means that we achieved what we wanted if not then uh, then it's a double problem because we would have ruined it and i would have to sell it so <laughs> anyway we'll, we'll see we'll see uh, just make sure that you follow us throughout uh, subscribe like share hit the bell so you get notified when the first video comes out and uh, you know fingers crossed and wish us luck